Hello, everyone at MUG. Um, my name is Crystal Huff. My pronouns are they, them. I live over in Somerville, Massachusetts. I am a graduate of the MUG program, um, and I have been gardening for longer than I will admit at this moment. Um, and I am really excited to uh, have taken on teaching the container gardening class in MUG because I have been gardening in containers for at least the past decade. Uh, like the, the primary amount of gardening that I do is in containers. And I am really honored that uh, Michelle recognized how much I know about this topic. Um, so I normally ask if folks want to sort of give a little note in the chat and say like your name, your pronouns, where you're located in the world, um, just that I have a sense of who's in the room. And uh, I know that some folks taking MUG are in the Boston area and, uh, and in Somerville in particular, because I heard from a little birdie. Um, but um, if you're in the area in general, I'd also welcome you to get in touch if you are interested in seeing my garden. You will see many photos of my garden in this presentation as well, um, when it's less cold out, in fact, or when the photos are from. Um, but I am super excited to be here. And yay, there are already two Somerville people uh, uh, saying hi in the chat. Thanks. Um, so this is the class on container gardening, which is presented by me. Um, and a lot of this is uh, presentation focused with Q&A at the end, but I did want to start out with a question and ask folks opinion. Uh, what is the difference between raised bed gardening versus container gardening? Uh, does anyone have thoughts or opinions? I'm totally going to give you a minute to think about it and answer. Brave soul, come on, brave soul. Containers have bottoms. Yeah, so that is like, size of container, containers having bottoms, those are some differentiators um, in my opinion as well. I would say that um, the reason why this is kind of a trick question, but also hopefully a like get the juices flowing question is that there's not really a wrong answer. Um, there are totally raised beds that have a bottom of sorts. If folks are trying to protect their raised beds from uh, contaminants that they know are in the soil, they might put a bottom in a raised bed. Um, there are totally containers that are really freaking huge, as you can see um, from this photo in my in my garden. I have several large barrels um, from a local brewery that I garden in, um, whether wine barrels or 55 gallon plastic drums, like huge containers. Um, that one could also call a raised bed, um, particularly the oak barrels, because as the oak barrels are used longer in my garden for gardening, uh, the bottom rots out and they become more and more like, you know, your traditional but huge and very deep raised bed. Um, so things that I am hoping to talk about with you tonight um, and cover kind of in a wild ride sort of way um, are aspects of containers, contents of containers, extensions of containers and plants that thrive in containers and, and how we make these choices and why. Um, and it, it will potentially feel like a bit of a, of a rushed, like there's a lot of information here and a lot of possibilities, um, or maybe it's totally familiar to you. Um, my goal is also to have some Q&A time at the end. So that's um, why I'm gonna do um, initially a lot more presentation. 
Um, I will say though, that if you have a clarifying question, like a, I don't recognize that acronym, or can I get the definition of that or whatnot, if I use jargon that you're not familiar with, please say something in the chat and I will trust that the trustees will handle clarifying questions in the chat if needed and that they will unmute and tell me if there's a question that's like a larger um, thing that they're unfamiliar with or that uh, that can be addressed briefly before we move on because clarifying questions can potentially uh, they run the risk of, of you focusing on the question and missing the rest of the material in the meantime. So I want to, I want to address those if needed. Um, also, as I said, you will see a ton of uh, pictures of my garden in various states. This is a nasturtium I'm particularly proud of. It was one nasturtium plant. Um, all right, so why do we use containers? Um, one of the things that I said uh, just a moment ago is that some folks have known contaminants in their soil. This is particularly true in Somerville where there was a lead paint factory and there's lots of known lead paint or assumed lead paint in the soil and you don't wanna be eating lead. Um, there, there are modifications to that statement that I would make in a scientific setting, but like the general understanding is you don't want to be um, experiencing known contaminants in your food um, and you can avoid that by using a container of known soil or fresh soil. Um, containers are also portable though. Um, I learned a trick a few years ago of growing an nasturtium in a small little pot and then when I had an aphid infestation in one area of my garden I moved the little nasturtium pot over there attract the aphids onto the nasturtium and then move the nasturtium away. Um, that can be incredibly beneficial to the health of your garden. Um, containers are very flexible in terms of what your options are. Um, like if you're gardening in the ground, then you are gardening in the ground. And like that is the level of dirt that you have, that is the access to the, to the groundwater that you have and you're like, you're operating under those conditions, there are a lot of different kinds of containers that influence what you get out of them. Um, and, and it just gives you another flexibility in terms of your options. Um, I would say that it is often easier to harvest things from containers. Um, it is not always the case. I totally have a large six foot garden stepladder in order to be able to harvest from some of my containers because I have these huge oak barrels and plastic drums um, that grow these nine foot tall tomatoes that start out at like the five foot level. And so I have a garden ladder to reach them. Um, but often it is easier to harvest from containers than from the ground because you can also have them higher up and be less stooping over in order to harvest. Um, also, it's often less money to garden in containers. Um, if you are buying soil to fill containers versus replacing an entire yard full of soil, uh, dirt starts out cheap and gets really expensive really quickly. Um, and it can be less money to refresh the dirt in containers um, rather than replace an entire yard full of soil. Um, so in terms of the aspects of a container, um, you want to think about adequate depth and diameter of a container for the type of plant that you want to grow in it. Um, you wanna think about the material that the container is made out of. Um, you wanna think about water stuff um, and you wanna think about whether you have the option to reuse a container, recycle or upcycle a container or whether you need to buy a new container. Um, and so in terms of depth and diameter rules of thumb, this is just a rule of thumb and some plants are very special in terms of uh, their specific needs. Um, but if you go by the rule of thumb of the pot diameter being about a third of the plant's height, then you are probably in a good place. Um, you also need to think about the pot depth 
being around a third of the expected plant's height, which I totally should have had on this slide as well. Um, and I've given this class several times and this is the first time I've noticed it. Um, but that's all modulo the kind of plant that you're growing, right? There are some fast growing plants with really deep root systems that need deeper containers. Um, tomatoes are an example of that. Um, and slower growing plants with shallower roots can do well in shallow containers. Um, and, and peppers are maybe an example of that compared to tomatoes. Um, but again, yeah, many plants hide a quarter to a third of their height in the roots. So you want to think about depth, you want to think about the diameter, you want to think about like um, how to make space for the plant to be as successful as possible. Um, in terms of materials of a container, uh, this is clearly a picture of my garden at an earlier stage and earlier in the season than some of the other photos in this show. Um, but I believe you can see examples of each of these, each of these materials in this photo. Possibly I don't have a fabric bag in this photo, but um, the basics are having ceramic pots, terracotta pots primarily, but other ceramics too. Um, plastics, I actually use a lot of um, upcycled plastic containers for my gardening. Um, Fabric grow bags are the most common, but I've totally grown, uh, I've grown squash in a uh, reused uh, shopping bag that the handles fell off of, you know, like, um, like a canvas, um, a canvas bag. Um, early in the pandemic, when people were making lots of uh, PPE for anyone who needed it, a friend of mine uh, volunteered for a group that was that was doing hospital gowns and they had a bunch of spare fabric on the edges and she made a bunch of uh, grow bags out of the spare PPE fabric. You know, you can totally get creative. Um, and, and people think of wood in terms of a container like a, the edges of a, of a raised bed, but you can create a, a wooden planter box. Um, you can create um, various containers that are that are not the traditional shape look of uh, planter boxes. Um, in this photo, you might be able to see like a three tiered sort of an odd angle to see it from here, but there's a three tiered stacked um, wooden container. Um, that is a nested container of tiers of strawberries. Um, and that was uh, a thing that was given to me and totally works. I grow, I grow garden and lots of things though. Um, in terms of the, the aspects of containers that are ceramic, that are useful to look at, um, ceramics are usually porous, at least partially, although they might have a partial glaze. Um, they usually at least have porousness on the bottom of a, a ceramic container and like here are two examples from my indoor plants. Um, that gives more air to the roots of the plant. If you have a plant that really doesn't want to ever experience sitting in water like a cactus, that is a good container for a cactus or for a succulent maybe. Um, the terracotta containers pull moisture away from the inner part of the dirt in the container. Um, they wick out the moisture. This means that you might need to water more often or you might be watering the appropriate amount because like the container is doing part of the work for you to make sure the plant doesn't drown. Um, notable is also that ceramic containers retain heat. Um, this means that sometimes folks will grow things in terracotta pots at the beginning and end of the season in particular because they will absorb heat from the sun during the day and retain it longer during the night. Um, and so if you are uh, if you are growing a plant that it's just slightly too early to start in the season or you want to make sure that it lasts through the end of the season, um, that might be a way to do it is to grow it in a container that has the the heft of and the heat retention of the the terracotta or other ceramic containers. Um, 
there's a traditional English gardening method that's also like growing plants up against a brick wall, same concept. Like the brick wall retains the heat from the sun during the day and then radiates ever so much of it at night to keep the plants just a little bit warmer, just a little bit longer in the season. Um, ceramic containers are usually heavier and therefore harder to blow over, although not impossible. This is why I don't garden in a ton of them now is because I have a tendency to trip on them and knock them over or the wind blows them over. And then they crack and are not nearly so pretty anymore. Um, they can also crack with freeze thaw cycles. In particular, if it's, uh, if it's a maintained steady temperature, then they won't necessarily crack. But like the fluctuations that we've had in Boston area over the past uh, month or so might very easily cause uh, ceramics to uh, crack. Um, looking at plastic containers, um, something that I didn't mention about terracotta or ceramic containers, but that is true is that they are sometimes very hard to thoroughly clean. If you've had a plant that was that got a disease. Um, maybe you had a plant that got powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is really annoying to get rid of and plastic containers are the easiest to disinfect afterwards um, if you just wanna wipe the whole slate clean. Uh, there are some plants that are super susceptible to powdery mildew and you might wanna do that. Um, and so you might wanna grow those plants in plastic containers. Um, plastic containers can also retain moisture more. Uh, they are, freely available in many, many options. Um, and so you see some of them here, um, the like hanging plastic containers, the like plastic bins. Um, we basically for my mutual aid gardening group, we received a heck of a lot of these yellow plastic bins and we just drilled extra holes in the bottom for drainage and used them to garden in. Um, you know, free free containers for gardening. Um, plastic containers are really easy to modify if you need to add more drainage, for example, or if you wanna make it into a self-watering planter, um, you can buy it pre-made as a self-watering planter, um, but you can also create a self-watering planter with a plastic container. And it tends to be a lot more successful in plastic containers than other materials. Um, they can be flimsy, they can be brittle. If they're um, several years old, plastic containers can get brittle and break. Uh, they also don't tend to have insulation. Uh, it kind of depends on the thickness of the plastic, but not really. Um, and there is also some uh, research to say that, for example, in, in disposable water bottles, like plastic that heats up can leach chemicals into the water. Same can be true for uh, container gardening. So you want to take a look at what kind of plastic the container is made of before deciding whether or not you're going to garden in it or what you're going to garden in it. Um, just in terms of safety and being aware, being more informed is good, right? Um, in terms of plastic container options, um, similarly, you can have window boxes. You can get just a regular planter that's shaped the same as a terracotta planter, but is made of plastic. Um, I do a lot of gardening like this uh, in the photo, which is a food grade bucket um, from my local bakery, which my neighbor, the baker, brings home after it's emptied of peanut butter or whatnot. Um, and I drill holes in the bottom and I grow things in it. Um, I think this one was yeah, nasturtium and beans. Um, but if it's a five gallon food grade bucket or larger, um, then you can even grow like peppers and tomatoes in them. Um, I also at the beginning of the pandemic uh, came upon some, not came upon, um, there was a misdelivery of large trash bins at my address um, and after a month of seeing people just throw dirt, uh, not dirt, throw trash in them uh, as they walked by the house and waiting for them to be picked up and whatnot, eventually I turned them into self-watering planters. Um, they were huge. They were a very large container. Um, I put a lot of thought into how to make them 
a reasonable self-watering planter in terms of expense of filling it and whatnot. And we'll get into that later in this presentation. Um, but it just goes to show you can make a lot of different things and, and surprising things into gardening options. Um, and that's one that I did. <laughs> um, you can also reuse or recycle um, smaller containers, much smaller containers when you're starting your seeds, which I'm starting my tomato seeds. Um, I have started some of my pepper seeds. Like this is how I do some of those. Um, I take maybe yogurt containers, um, clear plastic bottles are often used for um, winter sewing projects, but also sometimes for just sewing indoors. Um, you want to take like a rigid plastic, um, uh, you want to check what kind of plastic it is and you don't want to use a vinyl plastic or styrofoam or polycarbonate. Um, those are not considered safe, at least for food. And I do focus a lot on food gardening. Um, so just get creative with it is, is really part of the point here. Um, in terms of other material options, um, this is one of my favorite fabric go bags. Um, I wouldn't say that it's terribly successful in terms of keeping it watered enough for tomato plants. This was uh, an experiment that I did differently again next year. Um, and I put peppers in it instead of tomatoes because peppers don't require nearly so much watering and peppers object even more strenuously to having their roots stay wet um, as opposed to tomatoes. And so um, you can use fabric grow bags, you can use fabric canvas bags, um, you can make fabric bags. Um, they're really lightweight. They come in lots of different shapes and sizes. They're really porous, so um, drainage is really good. Root aeration, um, which is required for plants to survive in general, like they want some aeration at the roots and that's a service that in ground gardening, you would have earthworms provide. Um, in container gardening, fabric grow bags just automatically have a ton of root aeration um, because there's lots of, uh, air that can get through the, the fabric. Um, you can also put a drip tray underneath fabric grow bags in order to have it just have a little extra boost against having it drain out, uh, having it dry out quite so quickly. Um, they're easy to move. Um, they're easy to dump out. I, I grow potatoes and sunchokes in fabric grow bags every year. Um, because you can just start the fabric grow bag out with a little layer of soil and your starter potatoes or your starter sunchokes. Um, actually, I don't bother with doing this process for sunchokes anymore, but starter potatoes, layer of soil. Um, and then as the potato vines start to grow up, um, you add more dirt as though you're mounding it, which you would do in an in-ground garden for potatoes. Mound more dirt above let the vines grow up through the dirt again, put more dirt into the grow bag. This is how I grow potatoes now. And I currently have two grow bags worth of potatoes in process already, which as soon as it gets warmer out, I will take outside and start to get used to the outdoor environment once it's warm enough. Um, and they'll be, you know, head and shoulders above, like ahead of where I would otherwise be because I've got these fabric grow bags and because I've got them inside in terms of um, like getting a head start. Um, it's really easy to store fabric grow bags. You can empty them out and roll them up and store them. You can also wash them if you have experienced um, like uh, disease in the plants that were in the, the grow bags, you can just toss them in the washing machine. I don't tend to, but you can. Um, and there are just some uh, some brands um, that I had uh, that I wanted to make sure people were aware of, but there are so many brands now. It's not um, it's not hard to find if you Google fabric grow bags. Fabric grow bags can also be this. I forget where this garden is, but it's somewhere in the Boston area. I want to say in Dorchester. 
Um, and these are fabric grow bags that are sort of rolled around the dirt and then along the line in the middle is where the seedlings are put in or the seeds are planted. And I just find this really inspiring. Um, so finally, in terms of um, container options, wooden containers. Um, as I said before, they can be homemade. Um, wooden containers can be well balanced in terms of wicking. Um, they, they pull some water from the center of your dirt clump um, that's in the container, but they also retain some water um, and retain it like on the edges of the container. So it's not at the center of your root ball of whatever plants you're growing. Um, in this container in the photo, I increased that likelihood by lining the barrel with fabric um, so that it would wick more water out from the center and also retain a little bit more. And also I would be at least a little more assured of transport of water throughout um, the container if there was just like more water pooled at the bottom, like it might wick up the fabric toward the, the surface where, where more of the plant would be. Um, wooden containers are biodegradable, which also means that they can degrade quickly. Um, I have had the bottoms rot out of wooden barrels, um, not in the course of a couple of years, but maybe in the course of 10 years. Um, you can get moss on wooden containers in particular. Um, you can get lichen. Uh, I like moss, so that's a benefit for me, but if you don't, or if you're worried about it, um, you might want to uh, consider not doing that. You can also get mold. Um, and the nitrogen stealing question, um, there is some indication that as wood decomposes, um, that it utilizes nitrogen in order to do so. And what this means is that you can supplement the nitrogen in your containers if you're using a wooden container that you're worried is, is degrading or rotting. Um, but you can also just like, um, I guess it's a, it's a thing to be aware of. Um, I have seen it potentially have some impact in my garden, but there were other things I didn't control for. Um, and this is a thing about which gardeners disagree in terms of how big a factor it is. Um, there's also a traditional gardening method called hugel culture, which you might've heard about in a different class in Mug, um, which is intentionally putting uh, putting wood underneath your garden or as part of your garden's base layer um, with the intention of having it create compost over time. Um, it's, it's a thing to be aware of, I guess, is what I would say is like what your, what your plants look like and if they look like they need more nitrogen, um, it might be because of the wooden container. Um, before we start this next bit, I feel like I'm talking really rapidly. And so I just wanna check in. Um, how are folks doing? Um, I'm seeing a couple of nods, okay. Um, so when we think of a container, um, the outside is obviously important, but the inside is potentially the most impactful. Um, we wanna think about the dirt components uh, we want to think about what amendments or fertilizers you might want to use when container gardening. We want to think a lot about water. Um, and you potentially want to think about um, how to go about mulching and what materials to use for mulch. Um, and I see a question in the chat. Um, and I... I think the answer is the opposite. Um, so the question in the chat is, does drilling holes at the bottom of a wooden container help prevent decomposition or rotting? And I think it actually helps assist decomposition by virtue of breaking up the material more and creating more surface area for water to like more um, completely involve the wooden material, if that makes sense. Um, but I could be wrong. That's actually not something that I have 
personally researched. Um, and I guess if other folks have thoughts about that or um, or experiences, um, maybe that would be a good thing to return to at the end. Yeah, let's do that. Because um, I would be interested to hear. Um, so in terms of what's inside a container, uh, dirt. I have you had the the mug class on dirt composition yet? Is there a mug class on dirt composition still? Maybe. We had our soil one. Yeah, we did. Okay. Awesome. So this is familiar territory for you. Um, you, in container gardening in particular, want to use some version of potting soil. Um, uh, Gardening in a container is different than gardening in ground because you have to worry more about things like water distribution within the container because you don't have access to groundwater. Um, and so you want your dirt composition in the container to include some amount of compost or loam, um, some sort of uh, material that has water retention like coconut core. Um, traditionally, Potting soil has included peat moss, um, but the way it's harvested is really ecologically damaging. And so I would encourage, yeah, it sounds like that's a familiar um, idea to folks. If you're not familiar with that topic, happy to go into it in Q&A or um, elsewhere, but I would urge people to consider coconut core. Um, there's, also, there's also perlite and our vermiculite. Um, these are um, materials that are mineral in nature, and also assist with moving water around within the container without necessarily retaining the water, if that makes sense. Um, also, if you're using straight up bags of perlite or vermiculite, um, please be aware that you should be wearing a mask um, because if you breathe in those minerals, like they're literally people who mine those minerals get lung diseases. Um, ask me how I know. Um, also in terms of potting soil, um, if you're making your own, I highly recommend either obtaining worm castings or doing uh, worm composting. Um, and if you are interested in worm composting, I have already set up at least one member of this class with worm, with red wiggler worms to compost with. I'm happy to do that for more. I have two wormeries. They're great. They're great for your garden. Um, and uh, there are several brands that you could purchase if you want to purchase potting soil. Um, I particularly like Coast of Maine and Fox Farm Happy Frog. Um, I also just love that name. Um, and there is a general rule of thumb, which I do not follow as often as I should, um, that you should consider replacing a third of your dirt in containers every year or two. Um, in terms of the health of your dirt, the avoiding uh, compaction, the there are a bunch of benefits to if you're in a container and you're not like trying to do a no-till in-ground garden, um, cycling and replacing um, some of the dirt. Do you replace a third of soil in small containers or just all of it? Um, it depends. Sometimes with small containers, what I will do is I will dump all of the dirt out of a small container um, into a pile and I will mix in additional new compost um, and worm castings and whatnot. And then I will either redistribute in the containers that they started in, or I will use that to supplement a larger container that it's harder to get dirt out of. Um, so it, it depends is the answer, but um, uh, in terms of container gardening, uh, you want to think more about fertilizers and amendments than you might in, in ground. Um, because again, uh, worm castings are hugely beneficial for your plants um, and they're inexpensive. And also in a container, your plant usually doesn't have access to worms, you know, unless you put them there. Um, so adding that benefit back in, um, whether you're doing worm composting, uh, such as this pile of worm compost and worms, 
uh, is like literally me dumping it out and trying to figure out how much I can harvest of the worm castings. Um, or you can buy worm castings, um, or you can ask me for worm castings. Uh, there are worm casting options. Um, you can also buy other amendments. Um, Neptune's Harvest has a really great kelp amendment um, in terms of if your plants need nitrogen. Fox Farm has really amazing amendments, which are also pretty spendy. Um, and there's also stuff like mycorrhizal inoculants, which is mushroom uh, mycorrhizomes. Um, mushrooms, mushrooms are really beneficial to plants and also help create a network of mycelia that, that moves water around within a container or, or whatnot. So like um, there's added benefit there, but like buying mycorrhizal inoculant is really, really, really spendy. Um, so if you have it, don't waste it. If somebody's giving it away, claim it. Um, uh, and there are other fertilizers amendments, but you want to think more intentionally about uh, what access to nutrients your plant has in terms of um, a container, because you have a limited amount of space in that container. It's not like you can just heap more compost on um, every month or something um, when, when you need more. Water. Um, so water is one of those things that it depends on the plant and it depends on uh, like other conditions, like how dry it is, how, um, how much rain you've gotten recently. Like there are a whole bunch of um, water related things that are sort of environmental conditions that are not directly like you give your plant water. Um, but also you need to think about how much you give your plant water. You need to make sure that your plants are not drowning, which generally means drainage holes. Although again, um, there are some terracotta containers that, um, that wick the water away and don't require drainage from, uh, from the bottom. Um, in terms of making sure that your plants get enough water as opposed to too much, um, you can also put in irrigation. Um, you can make use of drip trays underneath your containers, um, which function as sort of a kind of a water reservoir. Um, and then you can also do uh, a container with a water reservoir um, or a self-watering planter, I think. No. Um, so this is the DMC rooftop garden. Boston Medical Center, yes, Boston Medical Center rooftop garden, um, which uh, one of the other MUG graduates now helps manage. Um, this is an incredible effort in terms of irrigation, in terms of planting and maintenance. Um, I am in awe, <laughs> um, but particularly the irrigation on this setup is, is just so, uh, extensive and impressive that I wanted to make sure that you thought about, like, there are lots of options, even if you're gardening in uh, milk crates that are lined with fabric. And even if you're gardening in a place that has no access to groundwater and not really a reasonable way of having um, a rain barrel here, um, you can still do really impressive irrigation without like letting it go to waste and without like um, without having too little. Um, so self-watering planters. Um, does anyone know uh, what I mean by a self-watering planter? Kind of referenced it a little bit earlier and then realized that I hadn't actually defined it. Um, planter that waters from the bottom. That is one option. Um, if you look at the bottom right uh, planter here on this slide, um, that self-watering planter is uh, the top container or the top stripe is the dirt. And then there's like an insert hole and that's where you put the water in. And the bottom part is the water reservoir. Um, 
You can also have self-watering planters that you water from above though. Um, and I think all of the other ones here, not that you can tell the details of the upper left one, but all the other self-watering planters here are water from above. And then it just like, you water it from above, but the water goes straight down a tube to the water reservoir. It doesn't hit the plants in between. Um, so, um, this is one example of a self-watering planter um, that has a tube that goes down to the bottom and you have the layers of like the water reservoir container and then something to keep the insert with the soil up above the water so that it's stable and doesn't like get crushed down into the water reservoir. Um, and you have a hole in that um, in that soil container where you can stick some wicking fabric um, or you can pack that area with soil to pull water up from the bottom of the reservoir in order to keep the plant watered. It keeps the plant watered more stably, more consistently. Um, so long as you have water in the reservoir, your plant is watered even if the top is dry. And so if you, for example, have problems with indoor plants that have um, like fruit flies or um, or other insects that are growing on the surface, growing other insects that live on the surface of the thing um, of the soil. Like you can starve out those insects by having a water reservoir be how you water your plant because they just won't have enough water on the surface of the soil to hatch the insects' eggs. Um, so this is my self-watering planter process, um, and it is. It is a little extra. Um, it is a little ridiculous. Um, I get these 55 gallon drums from my local brewery. Um, I clean them out. I insert um, like a pipe or an exit for um, where I want the top of the water reservoir to be so that above that point, water comes out of the container. Um, I put a perforated black pipe in the bottom that um, enables water to flow into the perforated pipe, but also does not like, it just, it's a way of creating that separation to make sure that not all of the dirt is resting in the water reservoir and like create some stable structure underneath. Um, I also now usually wrap that um, perforated pipe in the third picture with uh, wicking fabric so that again, it helps move water around um, within the planter. Um, and then I start filling it with a soil mixture that has a lot of um, cocoa core and a lot of vermiculite and perlite to assist with getting the water up from the water reservoir into the area where the plant's roots are more normally closer to the top. Um, and you, you can also see a little bit in the fourth photo that like on the left-hand edge of that fourth photo, there's a there's a pipe that goes down to the bottom. That's the watering pipe to get the water to the water reservoir. Um, it's not perfect. It's a little extra. It's a little ridiculous. Um, but that is what helped my tomatoes survive and thrive during last year's drought. Um, they they had access to a lot more water than um, than some of the other containers, um, and it moved around a lot better. They were also very assisted by mulching, which uh, if you don't already know, mulching can retain more water in containers as well as retaining more water in, in ground gardens. Um, this photo is a dump from uh, the chip drop, which is the like get trip, getchipdrop.com, the website where you can sign up for free delivery of wood chips from arborists, but you can't tell them how much you want. And so you might get two carfuls. <laughs> Um, this is a two car driveway full of wood chips. It definitely supplied me with wood chips for the year. Um, also, I've recently moved more to mulching with straw. Um, I don't like that straw often has weed seeds in it and you get some grass growing, um, but I do like that it's a lot less heavy a mulching substance. And so if I want to move the mulch aside, 
and plant something new, or if I want to plant seeds that are um, that are supposed to sprout through the mulch. It's a lot easier for seeds to sp sprout through the mulch if the mulch is straw than if it's wood. Um, there are also other mulching materials. Um, I don't particularly endorse mulching with like recycled plastic materials and whatnot, but I know that some people have done it. Um, so I wanted to just note that there. Okay, we're nearing the end. You can tell because I'm talking about space and time. Um, so in terms of extending the capabilities of a container, you wanna talk about space capabilities with trellising, and you wanna talk about time capabilities in terms of season extension. Um, so trellising in containers can also get really creative. Um, you, can, you can buy interconnecting uh, trellising, like, like kind of remind me of Lego blocks or I forget what the other kids' toys were that I used to use, but like they interconnect with poles and these like um, vertical pieces that snap into each other. Um, and you can create all sorts of different shapes of, of trellising. Um, you can also do as this middle photo, um, like you can have uprights of bamboo or whatever sticks and then just wrap string as a ladder. Um, and that works really well for beans and squash and stuff. Um, you can insert trellising part way into uh, a raised bed um, and do like a, a lean to style. Um, and you can create the ladder of the trellising as the plant grows, rather than having it all pre-established at the beginning of the season. There are a lot of options there. Um, if you are um, doing trellising, like you can also uh, have one stick upright and then tie to it and have multiple strings come down to the edges of your container, like in this bottom left. Um, that can be a really great way to grow beans, um, Malabar spinach, like some vining things, um, the vining beans in particular, um, in case it's not clear, but also potentially cucumbers, um, depending on how big your container is. Um, you can use netting um, and just like attach netting to uh, uprights on either side. You can reuse soccer goals. I definitely support anybody who does that. Um, rope ladders, uh, you know, uh, you can get really creative. Um, I definitely get creative. Uh, these are all from my garden. These are, um, these black poles are uh, deer fence posts, which are nine feet tall and which I grow tomatoes up and every year have to top off my tomatoes because they have surpassed the nine foot height. Um, I also use a lot of bamboo sticks, um, particularly for things that have um, cherry tomatoes as opposed to slicer tomatoes on them. Um, I use a lot of these arches um, and I run string um, across the ladders uh, supports of the arches to give them more, um, to give the plants more to stick to, more to grab onto. You can see in the bottom right, like my cucumber plant is reaching for more of the strings that's like um, strung across the, the ladders of the archways. Um, yeah, like there are a lot of trellising options and, um, and you can also like have plants go from like one option to another, um, particularly if you let them go wild a bit. My, my cu cucumbers and squashes frequently end up where they're not supposed to be. Um, for this reason. Um, in terms of container season extension, um, so season extension is when you're trying to make the season longer um, and you can do that by starting out earlier in the beginning. Um, you can start seedlings before it's warm enough outside to have them and start growing them inside and um, they will become adult plants sooner. Um, you can uh, do season extension at the end of the season um, where you have fully adult plants and you bring them inside. Um, this photo is of me bringing in my uh, citrus plants and some pepper plants and 
uh, lots of pepper plants, also some basils and like my, my house gets very crowded when it becomes too cold for some of them to be outside. Um, the in and out method, if you bring sensitive plants indoors at night, really only works if you only have a few of them. You don't wanna do this for a lot of plants. It gets really annoying. Um, but it's also good training for um, in the beginning of the season, if you start seedlings early inside, um, we do it what's called hardening off to get them ready to go outside. Um, are folks familiar with what I mean when I say hardening off? Yeah, okay. Um, also in terms of season extension, if you don't wanna fuss with having plants inside, which is totally valid, um, you can have what's called row covers um, or cold frames. These, these are row covers um, and they're hoops that uh, an agricultural plastic has been attached to with binder clips. Um, they keep more heat in next to the plants. They still let in most of the sunlight. Um, they don't, like if you're using the plastic row cover, they don't let water into the plants. If you're using a cloth row cover, they can let water in, but you probably still want to water some. Um, they're another way of having the area you're gardening in be warmer than the rest of the air. Um, and so the goal is to um, make it seem more like spring or more like fall as you, uh, as you enter spring or as you exit fall. Um, slightly more conducive for um, cold weather crops in general, but um, you can use rug covers with a lot of plants. Um, and a thing to think about in particular when you're using row cover or when you're bringing plants inside, um, but also in general when you're growing plants in containers, uh, having plants be spaced out way more than you see on any of these photos of my garden, way more, uh, means you will have fewer aphids or other pest insects. Um, I tend to suffer from pest insects because I wanna grow as much as possible in as little space in my urban jungle as possible. Um, if I were willing to space things out more, I would have fewer pests. Um, they would be more vulnerable to predators if, in terms of spacing out plants and they would be um, easier to detect before there's a huge infestation. Um, so space is really good for plants, aside from the obvious, like space is good for plants because then they get more sunlight if they're a sunlight loving plant um, and they get more access to a larger portion of the water um, if water is a limited resource. Um, it's also helpful to address pests. So I, uh, this is a do as I say and not necessarily exactly as I do sort of slide. Um, and finally, I wanted to uh, talk about a couple of crops that really thrive in containers. Um, like I am of the firm opinion that you can grow almost anything in a container and I do, um, but there are some that are particularly uh, welcoming of a container environment, of a limited option in terms of space and whatnot. Um, mixed greens don't require a lot of root space, and so they're fine with containers. Peppers really like having their roots limited in a way, but not like competing with a lot of other plants. But the limited root space is something that certain varieties of peppers have really responded well to. Um, tomatoes and eggplants don't mind at all. Um, you can grow all of those in a five gallon bucket. Um, I grow tomatoes in way larger containers and I get way larger tomato plants, but you can grow all of those in a five gallon bucket. And if you're looking for growing tomatoes in a five gallon bucket, just look for something that's called patio variety. Um, that's also true for eggplant. There are a couple of patio varieties. I don't think I've ever seen anybody label peppers as patio varieties, but that's what that term means anyway. Um, cucurbits, um, squash, cucumbers, um, melons, you can totally grow these in containers. Um, I grow them in large containers in part because those 
plants have vines that are susceptible to the squash vine borer. And if you, um, if you suffer from that pest, it is useful to be able to take that vine and stick it back in the dirt to reroot um, in terms of not losing the entire plant. Um, and so I grow them in larger containers in part because of that. Um, but you can totally grow them in containers. It's in fact traditional to grow herbs in containers and have like a bucket of rosemary or a, a small planter of thyme or whatnot. Um, we already talked about potatoes and sunchokes. Um, I totally grow my peas and beans in five gallon buckets. And in fact, for my peas, I grow a five gallon bucket and then I put chicken wire around the edge of the bucket and going up and that's the trellising I use for my peas. Um, and strawberries, totally happy with containers. Um, I have not had as much luck as I would have thought with carrots being in containers, um, but possibly a five gallon bucket is not big enough for carrots to be truly happy or possibly like, we just had a lot of drought last year. Um, and I see in the chat for five gallon containers, do I recommend any particular types of cucumbers or types of beans? Um, so for five gallon containers, definitely bush beans. Um, and in particular, I really like the Midnight Black Turtle Bean from Fedco. Um, and um, if you have like trellising options nearby, um, you can have a really happy um, like rattlesnake bean, which is a pole bean, um, or even you can do uh, like a, um, a runner bean, like a scarlet runner bean, you have to have a lot of trellising nearby for that. And so often because a five gallon container is more portable, you're less likely to have it near a lot of trellising options. So just think about the growth habit of the type of bean or the type of cucumber. Um, and I, I tend to grow like three or four different types of cukes just to see what's super happy this year and doesn't succumb to powdery mildew or doesn't like get eaten by the squash vine borer or whatnot. So um, other than the Suyo long cucumbers, which I definitely love growing and definitely need a lot more space in terms of trellising and root space, I don't have a, a specific recommendation on that. Um, and now we are at questions. Um, so I think I will stop sharing so I can see you and, uh, and see the chat more easily as well. Hello, and I would love to see your lovely faces. Um, particularly if you're interested in coming to visit my garden, happy to see your lovely faces. Um, okay, uh, does anyone have a new question? Joanne, you're unmuted. Do you have a question? Now I'm trying to make sure that I have a new question. Um, I, I would love to come see your garden. Um, so thank you. Um, I have never, I've been gardening on my roof in containers now for, you know, eight to 10 years and I, I love it. I've, I really would, um, I really want to, expand it's mostly been decorative plants and you know some some semi-successful tomato growing but this year I really want to try and and start growing some vegetables so I'm really um interested in that um so this has been this has been great um and I just want to make sure that I kind of get off on the right foot and pick the, the things that are most likely to to work out so uh, in terms of growing on a roof, like you're talking about growing on a, like a, a porch that has like a, a shade over it, or uh, do you go out onto the roof material in order to garden? Because that roof material often like draws more heat toward the, the roof. And so it's a factor in terms of thinking about how your plants are gonna go. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely, we have a, it's a roof deck there. It's full sun all day like just really a really hot sunny environment it's we have a um a gray um roof deck the roof itself is black but the surface of 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 where we 
grow is um, is a gray um, synthetic wood. So, so the other thing I need to think about is the weight of the containers. I obviously won't be able. To, I don't think I'll be able to do anything too heavy. I have to get everything up there myself um, in terms of soil and containers. So, so uh, in terms of the weight of containers on a roof deck in particular, um, when roof decks are constructed, they are constructed with the expectation that there will be a few people on them in terms of structural <laughs> engineering. Um, and so another thing, if you can afford it, is to talk to a structural engineer or an architect and say, can I just buy an hour of your time to take a look at this and make sure that if I add, you know, If I add like 500 gallons of soil, which when wet is fairly heavy, then I'm not gonna do damage to the house. Yeah. Um, and I say that again, force of experience, um, not on a roof deck, but definitely have uh, caused problems and learned from them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Should um, I shade, sorry. Should I have like some, some shade options for anything or so this is partially a like um think about uh resilience in the face of climate change answer um but if you if you gardened last year and also the year before you might have noticed that the year before last we had a tremendously wet year lots and lots of water um, many of my pepper plants drowned. Um, last year, we had a tremendously dry year. We experienced drought in Massachusetts and a more extensive drought than we've had for something like 50 years, possibly ever. I forget the statistic, but it was like drought enough that I researched what drought conditions mean in order to help my city councilors write an ordinance about water conservation, like very serious drought. There were a good six weeks there where all we got was four, four inches of rain the entire time. Really unacceptable for plants. Um, in that environment where we had a huge drought and might again experience similar things, having shade options that are like the ability to tie a white sheet to poles and shade in the worst of the heat of the day or shade every other day or something modulo what you can make happen given your life factors um, can potentially save your plants there's only so much watering you can do to combat drought conditions and and full sun all the time every day um, like shade structures are definitely something that a lot of folks use particularly on roofs um, and like yeah, I just, I encourage you to think about the options and what would actually be functional for you. Um, my garden is like next to a really tall house and part of it is in between two houses. And so shade is not my problem. Um, but in the future, if I'm, if I'm gardening on a roof deck or whatnot, I will be thinking about like, okay, how do I more easily get water here? Is it, I have a water, a rain barrel that, collects water here so it's not traveling back and forth um you know and like is the roof deck rated for that um but uh i think that your one-time cost of transporting the heft of dirt pre-watered dirt when it's dry and light and the heft of the containers is not the big concern there i think it's the long-term heft when when the dirt is fully wet. I think it's the long-term, like how many containers. Yeah. Um, and if you have more containers, you're more likely to do a lot more maintenance there and notice when there's a problem and make sure that they're fully watered all the time. And if you have fewer containers, you have less to worry about in terms of weight and uh, structural impact. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm happy to chirp at you some more.
um, do you have any recommendations for you know any particular books or websites or or where do you turn to for ideas and inspiration? Yes. So where I turn to um, as someone who I don't do a ton of reading for pleasure now because I professionally speaking I edit science fiction I do a lot of reading for work um uh so I tend to turn to YouTube videos um in particular YouTube videos uh make me happy because I can see what the person is doing in real time in motion etc um my favorite YouTube channels are uh the Epic Gardening channel with Kevin Espiritu, um, Roots and Refuge, um, like the Rusted Garden, um, like those are those are the places where I tend to turn. Um, but YouTube in general is where I tend to turn if I'm like you know researching how to deal with like are there any new methods of dealing with aphids. <laughs> Yeah, you know, because those are the bane of my existence. For that matter, squash vine borer. I really hate squash vine borer. <laughs> Great. Lori, you looked like you were unmuting for a sec there. Did you want to say something? I, I was, and I don't have a question, but I'm enjoying Joanne's questions. Thanks for asking those. I find them interesting. I just wanted to say thank you, and it was very informative. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. <laughs> uh, I I really loved the mug class and uh, people who come to the mug, mug class tend to have uh, a wide range of experiences and uh, capabilities. And I never know if I'm presenting things that somebody is, you know, this is old hat. I have known this for ages. Or if I'm, you know, offering a new perspective that somebody's never thought of before. Um, I a thing I've been thinking about actually is talking with Michelle about offering a session on mutual aid gardening, because I think that's something that's a lot more recent um, in terms of developments of gardening options that uh, folks in the mug class might want to be more exposed to. Yeah, I think uh, that's a good, uh, I think there's a number of people who are probably interested in that. Uh, a number of people seem to be more and more interested in um, uh, I don't know exactly what mutual aid gardens are, but maybe you can explain, but just in terms of getting more uh, fresh food to more people. Um. Yeah, yeah. So um, mutual aid in general is uh, just to give you like a quick, I know that we're we're going to wrap up shortly, um, but just to give you a quick um, once through, uh, mutual aid in general is uh, the idea that everybody has things they need and everybody has something that they can offer the community and that shared resources and, um, and assistance um, create a more resilient community and is better for everyone. Um, and mutual aid gardening in particular is something that I've helped coordinate with mutual aid of Medford and Somerville, um, with the Cambridge City Growers um, in my immediate neighborhood. Um, we help people set up gardens for the neighborhood. Um, sometimes we provide materials, sometimes we provide labor, sometimes we provide seedlings, um, like whatever is in need for a particular location um, in order to set up usually a vegetable garden, but also sometimes a pollinator support garden um, to have benefit to the folks in the neighborhood. Um, and uh, in terms of Lauren asking about the, the mutual aid garden in Union Square, yep, there's absolutely one in Union Square. Uh, mutual aid of Medford and Somerville actually has 22 gardens throughout Somerville and Medford. Um, and we, we offer support for people who are new to gardening. Um, we ask that people share the results of the garden, the vegetables or whatnot with folks in the neighborhood or take them to the community fridges of tomatoes, take some to the community fridge. Folks always need food there. Um, oh, that's and cool. it just, Thanks. Yeah, yeah. It just like creates a more resilient community and um, 
more sustainable and less food insecure uh, is the goal. Um, and folks can like sign up for a watering shift in a really like organized fashion, or they can be like, hey, I walked past this garden and I saw it needed watering and so I watered it, you know. Um, uh, there are lots of options. Okay. Um, I think that we are about ended for the session. Yeah, um, thank you so much. That was really informative. Um, the recording will be in the um, folder for everybody and I can send out Crystal's email in case you wanna get in touch. Um, but yeah, thank you very much and thanks everybody for hopping on. Yeah, definitely happy to chat and definitely contact me if you want to see my garden or if you want composting worms or both. Thank, thank you very much. It was great. Thank you so Bye, much. Bye everybody.